and WHO detection and uh, revenue management systems. And for the same, we have with us uh, Mr. Virendra Kumar, Delhi Jal Board, who is a meeting and he is going to join us a bit later. And we also have with us Mr. Robert Gaskin. Uh, from Rodic Consultants Private Limited. So we are going to have uh, the presentation by Mr. Robert Gaskin first, and after that we are going to hear from uh, the Legal Board. Uh, Mr. Gaskin, are you able to hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, Mr. Robert, sir, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh, sir, if you could also switch on your video, uh, then we'll be able to say you. Can I, can I then um, can I then share my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, so you can also sh start sharing your screen. Uh, Prena, can we make him the presenter? Not yet. So you are the presenter now, and I am going to quickly introduce you. And uh, after my introduction, uh, we will have the presentation by you, and then we are going to take some questions from the audience. And in between, if uh, some, if a representative from Delhi Jal Board is able to join, then we will have his presentation first, and after that, we are going to take the questions from the audience. So I am going to take just a uh, just half a minute to introduce you. Mr. Robert Kaskin is Assistant Vice, Vice President, Water and Urban Transportation at Rotic Consultants Private Limited. In the past, he has worked with Anand. A building team and at Patham uh, Thane and Bangkok, Thailand. He was also involved in the Bangalore Water Supply Reduction Pilot Project India and provided export water networking modeling, GIS, and IT input uh, during the uh, DMA setup to deliver 24 7 water supply in pilot area. Mr. Askin, please. I can't share my screen. It's grayed out. Tena, have we uh, made him the presenter? Tena, are you there? Have you given him the presenters, right? I'm sorry, there was some notification. I'm just making the presenter. Okay. So just allow us 10 seconds. We are going to make sure. you the Ah, great. Thank you so much. So I think you can see my screen now. Is that correct? We're able to see your screen, sir. Excellent. OK, so this uh, presentation is uh, guidance for achieving 24-7 water supply and reducing NRW. I'm Robert Gaskin, Assistant Vice President, Water and Environment at Roddick Consultants. And um, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about RODIC and my past projects, um, understanding the challenge, um, some helpful reports and books, um, some recommended working arrangements, contracts, and um, some guidance for actually achieving 20% water supply. So uh, RODIC is a uh, diversified um, engineering consultancy formed in 2000. We're based in New Delhi, uh, offices all over India, um, over 2,200 uh, employees. We cover a um, full range of services in a number of sectors, including water. Um, there we go. And myself, my sins, um, I started as a water engineer in uh, 1988, and I've tended to specialize on uh, leakage reduction, NRW reduction, um, uh, network modeling, hydraulic network modeling, uh, design of new systems, design of district metering, uh, GIS, information systems, etc. So understanding the challenge, um, here's a, a graph from um, JICA in Japan, and you can see um, uh, NRW reduction um, in uh, two cities, Tokyo and Osaka. And the first thing to realize here is that the graph starts in 1945 and it goes on to 2012. So this just brings home what a long-term uh, effort this is. Um, and we can see that in these particular cities have got down to very low percentage uh, leakage levels. 
but we should understand the percentage uh, leakage is is a little bit um, uh, of, a, of a funny uh, measurement. For instance, if I give an example, imagine you have a brand new system. Um, uh, you pressurize it, it has one liter a second leakage. That's 100% um, NRW, 100% leakage. Um, you get a new leak, it goes up to two um, liters a second leakage and your NRW is still 100%. Then you add say eight liters a second of customers and suddenly your um, percentage leakage will have dropped to 20%. So uh, this is a funny measure in some ways, the percentage leakage. Um, and even in Japan, uh, the uh, rural areas are more typically around 20%. And typically um, it, it, it's easier to get a low figure um, in urban areas because uh, th this is very dependent on uh, sales, not only leakage. Um, so when we look at um, district metering, there's been a lot of district metering uh, discussion. Um, what you actually see, and I, I don't think you can see my pointer, but what you see is this red line, which is flow over 24 hours. And with 24-7 flow, it, this, this flow has a certain profile and it comes down to a minimum night use, minimum night flow which is comprised of a little bit of customer use and quite a lot of leakage, okay? And this leakage, it's worth recognizing that there are two, two types of leakage, we can say. There's uh, what's known as burst leakage. We can, we can say this is the leakage which, with a lot of effort, you can find, you can repair, and you can save. And then there's background leakage, which is very small, uh, literally undetectable amounts of, of uh, weeps from joints, etc., and you cannot find it. The only way you can get rid of your background leakage is with pipe replacement. So it's worth having that understanding. Um, so yeah, district metering is something that came about um, for 24 seven systems primarily based on this night line. And if we look at the night line, that's the top line, how that will vary with time, um, it will generally increase. All systems over time, they get more leakage. And you can see your leakage increasing up to some limit where you decide to do something, um, you find some leaks, you repair them, and it drops down. And then it, this is the problem um, with this work. It's all full of uncertainty. So just because you um, repair leaks, it doesn't mean that you won't get new leaks. And so the leakage can rise up again. Uh, and then again, you'll, you'll uh, um, find the leakage, reduce, reduce the leakage back down again. Um, and this just gets, goes on and on in time until you feel, uh, right, this is not economic. This is the time to rehabilitate, to replace the pipework, etc. Um, and then you can uh, reduce your um, background leakage by replacement. Okay, so just a, that's a, just a description of that. Um, here's an interesting table. Um, this is some uh, contracts I worked on in uh, Thailand some time ago from 2000 to uh, uh, 2004. These, these were four year loss reduction contracts. Uh, so again, this was not intermittent supply to 24-7, this was already 24-7 supply. And we can see various statistics, numbers of connections, uh, initial NRW, final NRW, NRW reduction, uh, DMA is established, mains replacement, percentage of mains replaced, uh, leak surveys, and what we notice are on the uh, right-hand side, contractor to tended to um, replace more mains, conduct more leak surveys, and surprise, surprise, reduce leakage more for a, a lower unit price. Um, but one of the things this table brings up is the um, how different approaches can uh, get different results and the difficulty of trying to forecast what will happen with this type of work. So, next slide. 
So why, sh why intermittent supply should be unacceptable? So it's a good slide, I think. And uh, other presenters have already touched on many of these uh, topics. It's not safe to drink. Pipe velocities exceed design standards, weakening the pipe work, shortening the working life of the pipe and causing leakage. And we often hear, I've often heard um, in India how, you know, the, the, the pipe is old and then it turns out to be 30 years old. And I know there's other pipes which is a lot older. But I think this is because genuinely with intermittent supply after 30 years or so, it really is somewhat worn out in some places. Whereas in uh, with 24 seven supply, it's uh, very common to have much longer expected uh, lifespans of pipe work at minimum of 50 years and, you know, uh, often 100 years or more. Um, getting back to this, so the high air velocities overspeed and damage mechanical meters. District metering cannot be used in the traditional manner since there is no night flow. Leak detection cannot be conducted at low night flow in quiet nighttime environment. And for most purposes, you cannot do any leak detection except when there's water in the pipe. Um, in general, intermittent supply uses more water than 24 seven supply. That's, that's a, somewhat of a surprise to most of us. But study after study is, is verifying that and the earlier presenters uh, reinforce that point as well. True 24 seven demands and demand patterns remain unknown. Um, and, and we know they will change when you change from intermittent supply to 24 seven supply, the demand patterns will change. So the design of rehabilitation will be based on estimates and not real data. And obviously, perhaps the most uh, uh, obvious reason, uh, intermittent supply is not convenient for customers. Okay, some helpful reports and books, because this is a, a, a guidance um, presentation. So some guidance is, of course, already existing. This was the first report I had to read as a young engineer. This was issued in 1980. Um, and it covers the basics. It's well at well date now, but it covers good descriptions, not only of district metering, pressure reduction, but also step testing. Um, so this, this is very good background. Um, this is a recent book uh, by Bam Boss from uh, IWA, uh, dealing with complex interrelation of intermittent supply and water losses. So this book really delves into the details of intermittent supply and is very helpful and has some recommended approaches in it as well. This is a World Bank document, the use of performance-based contracts for non-revenue water reduction. So some, uh, a lot of the, the problems we have in India, I feel, are down to the contracts that are put in place. And it's extremely difficult to put in a, a good contract for um, an area with so much uncertainty in it. So this, this is very helpful, this document. And this is one of the uh, graphs from that, which um, uh, just describes some of the uh, common types of uh, contracts that uh, a supplier can have with a uh, contractor. So on the one end, on the bottom right, you have the DBOM contract, which is considered high risk transfer, very low speed to implement because contractors have a, you know, a, a lot of risk. They want, they need to take their time in pricing it, etc. And so it's a, a difficult thing to actually implement unless you have lots and lots of good data. Um, and then on the low side, you've got a, a cost plus contract, which is very quick to implement because there's very low risk. So you have to look at that that trade-off between the speed of contract and the risk. Um, and again, there's a little bit more detail um, in this table on, the, on those contract types. This is all from that report. So <coughs> that leads nicely on to um, consultant contracts, working arrangements, contract types. Um, so yeah, issues are a high level of unknowns and uh, uncertainty is the nature of the work. 
And so it's impossible, I feel, to get a good win-win long-term contracts until the actual costs are known. And you can find those out through pilot projects. So um, this is what I would uh, recommend being considered if you're if you're trying to implement this in any kind of sizable area um, we've seen a number of projects fail or the progress is very very slow so i would say don't put all your eggs in one basket spread your risk um, first of all hire not one but three consultants um, and this is not three times the cost because you divide your your area into into three um, so this will speed up implementation and spread your risk. The consultants, I would say, would issue a 30 month cost plus discovery contracts to three contractors. So this is, this is um, uh, you know, cost plus, it's uh, expensive but fair, but we're limiting the scope of the contract. So they're relatively short. And these are to discover um, you know, the issues involved, the true costs of doing work. These, these are effectively pilot projects. Um, and the consultants to supervise contractors and ensure collection of detailed data, because this is essential that we really learn from these contracts, what the true cost of doing the work is. If you do this, how many, how much leakage savings do you get, et cetera. And this gives the contractors a real opportunity to understand risks and costs, and then the consultants can issue longer term contracts based on the findings. So that would be my you know, recommendation to consider. And then achieving 24 seven water supply actually in the field, how do you do it? So okay, this, this looks a bit, um, uh, uh, point blank, implement 24-7 on trunk main and reduce NRW to acceptable um, uh, limits. So here it's, it simply says implement 24-7. Now, obviously, um, if the area is too large, the trunk main is too big or long, you cannot do it. You won't have enough water. This is a major problem implementing 24-7. It needs water. But in order to reduce NRW, you need water. You cannot find leaks effectively uh, by most methods without water. So you just need to scale back your area until it's small enough for you to be able to pressurize 24 seven. So concentrate on the trunk main because that's the first thing out of the treatment works or the reservoir. Um, once you've got your trunk main okay, or whatever length of it you, you've decided to uh, tackle first, then you can uh, focus in on a DMA. And this can be the whole DMA or part of a DMA, depending on your sizing and your, the amount of water you have available. And again, it's uh, uh, unfortunate, you just have to choose an area which you are able to pressurize 24-7. Um, it's, it's very, you know, almost impossible to make much progress unless it's pressurized. Then conduct your leakage sweeps and reduce NRW until no further improvement is seen. So you, you look for leaks when it's pressurized 24 seven, you repair, you get them repaired. You see the reduction, you repeat until you see no reduction. So you really, you really can't find any more leaks, um, you know. Then you see what the NRW is. If it's still too high, consider replacing customer connections. And when you replace your customer connections, um, fit a stopcock, a valve um, in an accessible location at the property boundary. Um, and sometimes you will find your coverage of uh, your pipes uh, is not sufficient. It may be the customer connections currently are too long and you need to lay some more pipe to shorten the customer connections, if that makes sense. That's sometimes an issue. Um, and once you've replaced customer connections, usually that leakage will come down uh, fairly significantly. If it's still too high, then consider replacing distribution pipe work, uh, but do it in a staged, prioritized manner. Record new levels of NRW and costs to achieve each stage. 
So by this point, um, you've got a lot of data. You've got real cost data, you've got real demand. So data. sorry to interrupt about uh, two more minutes for the presentation. Yeah, that'll be plenty, yeah. <laughs> so um, once you've uh, done this, you can consider customer metering once the 24 seven supply is secure. So coming very briefly on metering, um, as mentioned before, meters do get damaged, mechanical meters do get damaged with intermittent supply. Um, and you've got the air through the meter issue. So generally I would uh, recommend delaying that until your 24 seven uh, supply is established. So that's another reason why it's so important. And there we have it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, for the presentation. If you could just stop sharing the screen, then we'll be able to see you. Right. Sorry, I'm struggling to do that. So, Minda, I'm going to ask the questions to you. We have received a couple of questions from the audience for you. Uh, the first one is from Mr. Bharat Rajarao. He's saying that do you think cost plus or incentivized contracts work? And if you could also share some of the countries who have opted for cost plus and incentivized contracts. I, sorry, I didn't get all of it. Um, yeah. So uh, he was saying that uh, do you think the cost plus and the incentivized contracts are going to work in India? And if you could also share some of the countries who have opted for these kind of models, the cost for uh, cost plus and incentivized contracts. Okay, I'm going to struggle to give you examples just just like that. I think certainly those uh, contracts can help in India with a usage. So I I would I would not I would not let a 10 year or 15 year or longer contract on cost plus. I I I'm not recommending that, but I feel it has a place for short term discovery contracts. So, you know, you use them uh, to minimize risk to contractors to um, get the work started and find where you are and, and the condition of the network, develop some real data that can be used. And then you can see about the appropriate type of other contract. And, the, and those documents I shared, um, that they will give you the uh, recommendations on, on uh, you know, what might be an appropriate contract for you. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my next question to you is, in your experience, uh, sir, what do you feel which are the most uh, cost-effective uh, uh, leakage reduction technologies uh, that have been used uh, globally and could also be used in India? Some of the cost-effective NRW and leakage reduction technologies. Okay. So uh, as, as, I, as I've tried to say, in, in, in my experience, um, such as it is, I feel um, any kind of reduction technology with intermittent supply is very difficult, very limited success. So my suggestion is if you've got 24 7 supply, that is it really? And then uh, you've got so many kinds of uh, you know, technologies open to you, um, in, including the straightforward district metering. All right. Uh, we have also received another question for you. This is from Mr. Ravi Yadav. He wants to know that if you could vote on the option of 30 months consultant job and discoveries. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, I, even I don't know that. If Mr. Yadav, if you could, you know, just uh, elaborate on the okay. question. So if, in, in, yeah. in, in the World Bank document I, I shared, um, that, that gives you more detail of these type of contracts. So that, that's, you know, the, the, the answer's in there. But basically it's hiring a contractor on a, on a cost plus basis. So the contractor's risk is low and you can hire not just one, but hire two or three or more. Yeah. So you can see their different performance. 
um, and, and you discover um, more out about your network and what are the true costs to improve it. Because a, a lot of systems in India will have been weakened by intermittent supply that does weaken the pipe work. So, you, you, you know, are you looking at like 50% pipe replacement to get the NRW acceptable or is it 50% or 80%? You know. So, you can find that out only through real work. All right. Okay. Uh, so, sir, my last question to you is, uh, so what has been your experience with the Bangalore water loss reduction project? Was the target there for achieving non-revenue water level and what have what has been achieved so far? Okay. So, I'm, I'm very out of date of it on it. I had a, you know, a brief um, input in 2003, 2004, I think, uh, when it was starting off. And certainly, we, we our attitude straight away was we must have 24-7 supply in order to reduce leakage. So, um, usually when you set up a DMA, you carry out a, a pressure zero test or zero pressure test where you pressurize the surrounding DMAs and check your uh, uh, border boundary. They didn't have enough water for that. So, we, we tried a reverse uh, PZT, where we just tried to pressurize the DMA. And, and all credit to the field teams, uh, they, they were just determined to do the work and they, and they got it done. Some of the DMAs were, I think, oversized initially, they, they became smaller. Um, but, but I believe it, you know, the, the aims of the project were achieved. Um, whether it was then kept up, that, uh, that I don't know, that's another matter. All right, on that note, I'll bring this session to a close. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaskin, for joining us.